thing. They jump in and they look for what should I what should I see here? And I mean, on Google Analytics or any analytics platform, I, I you know, there are a lot of default reports. So there's massive numbers of, of reports, massive amounts of charts and numbers. And, and if you don't know what you're looking for, you can get completely overwhelmed and you're unlikely to get anything out of it that's actually useful. And welcome to a new episode of Digital Coffee Marketing Brew, and I'm your host, Brett Deister. And this week, we're going to be talking about B2B marketing, the most exciting marketing, not really exciting, but it's one of those marketings that we all we all need to know about. And even though it may not be the most exciting part, it is very important for a lot of businesses. But with me, I have Philippa with me, and she has... She's done a lot in this area. She can help you mostly in digital marketing strategies, digital, digital analytics. That means GA4, which is the newest Google Analytics out there, which is a different little plug or different little number thing that you have to use besides the previous one, which is the UTA. But we'll get in more of that as well. And she just has certific certification certified management consultant, and she's British as well. So we'll get a nice little English accent as well. So welcome to the show. Hi, Brett. Thank you. You know, what you just said reminded me of that famous saying, you know, it's a, a terrible thing happens if you don't advertise. Remember that? Yes, yes. It really is a terrible thing if you never advertise yourself. If you never advertise, you get nothing, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's true. You always got to spend money to make money is the other one, I think. is. Right, right. Anyways, the first question is, all my guests is, are you a coffee or tea drinker? Uh, both. Um, if that's allowed. So I'm British, right? So I have to drink. I mean, I have uh, right now, I probably have nearly 800 tea bags stashed away, uh, proper English tea in proper tea bags without, you know, the paper and all the, you know, little things that you pick it up with. I mean, we just, we just have big boxes of tea in England with, you know, in the supermarket and it, it's much cheaper than it is here. So I do have that, but I have to say that I also treated myself to an espresso machine. Um, so I'm allowed one espresso coffee in the morning. And uh, so both. <laughs> so you're still very European about your coffee because you, you said espresso instead of just the actual drip coffee. Because I know in like places like Italy, they just don't do drip coffee at all. They may give you an Americano, which was kind of an insult to Americans because they put hot water with an espresso. Yeah, no, sorry. Actually, that was a product advertisement because I actually said Nespresso. So I've got one of those machines. Um, but yeah. <laughs> No, no worries. And I gave a brief summary of your expertise, but can you give a, my audience a little bit more about what you do? Yeah, so basically I, I'm a, a digital marketing strategy and analytics consultant, uh, which I've been doing for a while. Um, so, and you know, I do that because I feel like a lot of people sort of, they jump straight into tactics like, oh gosh, we've got to do SEO, we've got to do social media, you know. Um, and what they don't do is stop and and come up with a holistic plan uh, before they do anything that says, you know, what's our goals? What are we trying to do? What's the best way to get to where we want to go? And how does, how will all the things that we're doing fit together, right, to create a, a full picture um, and then intelligently use analytics to figure out whether or not what you're trying to do is working. So, um, uh, it, it, it's not maybe the most sexy part of it all, although of course I think it is. Um, it's not, it's, I mean, it's not that you're immediately doing something that, that generates results when you create strategy, but on the other hand, it gives you a framework so you know where you're trying to go um, and you know when you're getting there. So um, that that's my goal. So, I mean, I understand stuff like SEO and so on, but I, I used to do it. I don't do it as a consultant anymore. Um, I'm, I'm the one that sort of says, here's a great idea, go away and make it happen. <laughs> oh yeah. I understand what you're saying is because most people, it's more of the big words are like, Hey, we need to do SEO, but no one really knows how to do SEO. They just need, they just know how to say we need to do SEO. Well, I mean, the, the, the truth is that there are lots of, of really good SEO folks around, um, and it's a very specialized subject and it's, you know, you can't be everything. I mean, it, it, marketing to me is very interesting these days because 
there are so many different skills that come into play. Um, and you know, there are, there are people who are incredibly creative and make incredibly creative, uh, writing or, or media or, or advertising, whatever it is. And then there are people who are incredibly analytical on a sort of the other end of the spectrum. Um, and, and you need all of that, uh, in marketing. So I, I'm choosing to hang out mostly at the analytical end, although I, I do write, uh, and I speak, <laughs> um, but you know, I, I I'm not visually creative, for example. So I'm not I'm not the one that can make the great the great visuals. Uh, but but uh, yeah, I I, I think it's it's important to really understand what you specialize in and and focus on that. And so since I feel like 2023 is the rehash of 2024, as AI is the forefront of everything in marketing. How how's that affected the SEO? side of it. Are we going to see more of that in 2024 because of just the prevalence of how AI has touched every bit of PR and marketing? I feel like there, I can't get away from talking about AI. Yeah. I, I, I mean, honestly, I, as I said, I'm not, I'm not the SEO expert as such. Uh, you know, what it, what it seems to be is, is that it's, it's very helpful in being a tool. So it can generate ideas, it can generate content ideas, it can do keyword research. Um, but I am certainly seeing, uh, I mean, I get PR requests every day, you know, um, most of them sort of say, you know, do not send me something that's AI generated. So in other words, use it to get ideas, use it to get a first draft, but then add your own spin at so it it sounds like you it, it looks like you know it's it's personalized and it's not um ai writing tends to be maybe a little generic maybe a little uh less personal um because of course it's it's written off of existing material because that's how it's trained right so um you you just kind of want to po polish it and make it a bit more original at in the end it, yeah i think the older models i think ga uh, not ga4 but it was chat gpt4 is actually getting a little bit more personal about it so we could be seeing a little bit more blending of it but i understand what you're saying is that yeah you can let you can have it write it but you go back through it and try to put more personality into it is what i'm hearing right right well, and that's what I'm saying. I'm just saying that, you know, this isn't my area of specific expertise, but I, I'm certainly seeing um, advice that, that you shouldn't you shouldn't use it for your final product. Yeah, that's that's fair. And I mean, what have you seen in the B2B marketing? Have you seen any of the emerging technologies being used very much? Have you seen like any of like the websites, like any of that type of stuff, have you seen that being prevalent in B2B as we're still really stuck in the B2C? And because I know B2B is a little bit more slowly transitions to more of the newer technology, but they wait a lot longer than the B2C por portions. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it, it depends what you're selling and, and what kind of a company you are and, you know, I mean, some B2B sites are, are very, very innovative. Um, uh, so I, I, I'm not sure that that's a, a specifically B2B, B2C distinction. Um, there are also plenty of B2C sites that are still not as sophisticated as they should be. So, you know, could be, I should say. And for the digital analytics, what should marketers be focusing on on now or in 2024 because i mean google's always switching their stuff around so what is specifically should they be looking at for to help their bosses understand like what's being i guess what's a success and what do they need to work on yeah so i mean honestly the biggest mistake that i see businesses making with analytics is is what i was talking about in the beginning is that it's the same thing they jump in and they look for what should i what should i see here and I mean, on Google Analytics or any analytics platform, I, I, you know, there are a lot of default reports. So there's massive numbers of, of reports, massive amounts of charts and numbers. And, and if you don't know what you're looking for, you can get completely overwhelmed and you're unlikely to get anything out of it that's actually useful. So 
unless you have that strategy in place so that you can go to the analytics and say, right, this is what we're trying to do. These are the, these are the KPIs. These are the metrics that are our measures of success. You know, whether that's growing conversions by X percent, growing the number of people who read our blog posts, um, getting more leads, whatever it is that you're trying to do or reducing our costs of acquisition, right? Um, unless you're looking at the numbers with a question in mind, um, it, it's difficult to get useful things out of it. Uh, on the other hand, um, I, I mean, a lot of people hate GA4, right? Because it's it's certainly not simple. It's not easy. It's It's complex to implement in a really fully customized way. But if you do, there are amazing rewards for it because it can really drill down into your data and give you some insights that you're likely not to have seen without that ability to really get into what you're looking at. So, you know, you can, especially using a tool like Google Tag Manager, you can really, really customize um, to to get to really into what you want. Um, uh, I mean, you're a podcast host, right? So, for example, um, most podcast sites have a long, long list of episodes on their on their website, right? So, the latest web the latest episode goes at the top of the list, and everything else moves down one. And what you end up with is a huge amount of amazing content that's essentially wasted uh, because nobody goes, nobody sees it because it's too far down the page, right? Um, and one of the things that you can do in analytics is, is do things like, like see how far down the page people look, or if there are specific topics or categories of content that they're interested in, which ones those are, um, so that you can really find all sorts of ways to, to leverage and continue to leverage the content that you've got rather than just sort of having having the one episode and, and after a couple of weeks it's got no traction anymore. And and a lot of people don't don't really think about this because they're not seeing the stats of, of who's who's consuming what content. Mm, well I mean talking podcast specifically, you're also competing with Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and all the other ones that you put yeah, your podcasts yeah. on. So you have right. like podcasters have a very unique like competition from their own podcast on a different site because the other different site is more reputable than your own website right but and then i mean you talked about you know b2b um for example something else that i see a lot of that, that, that the businesses aren't aware of is if is video so with a tool like ga4 you can you can you can literally get into if you've got youtube video right embedded on your website um, I mean, you can do this on YouTube too, but if you've got video on your website, you know, how many people watch the video and how much of the video do they watch, which is more important. Um, and a lot of people don't realize in general, about 50% of your audience for your video drop off in the first 30 seconds. That's huge. And by, by about a minute, you've lost 90%. I've seen this again and again, right? So unless, so, which is why when you start your video, you've got to say, here's the reason you should watch this video. And if you watch it all the way through to the end, you know, I'll, I'll be telling you something amazing. And, and, you know, you've really got to grab people and tell them why they need to watch it. Um, and so many, many businesses spend a lot of money and resources on making video that frankly, nobody watches. Um, and and again and and they don't know that that's happening so yeah it's well i mean yeah it's that and just the i guess the popularity of short form content has made people not willing to spend as much time trying to figure out if they really want to listen to it they'll t they'll probably spend even less they'll probably spend about maybe generously three seconds on a video and then they'll they'll go off somewhere else because TikTok and shorts and reels have really made attention spans even worse than before. Right. Well, but those are for entertainment. I mean, if your video is is an informational video, if the information's good, and again, if you make it compelling and you tell people what's coming up, they will watch it if they need that information, right? 
So it depends on the nature of the video as well. True. It depends on your audience, depends on the nature of the video, and it depends on the industry itself at the same time. Because, I mean, if people are specifically looking for that industry, your your video could do very well. But if it's a very popular industry, it could do not as well, If maybe because it's not as highly produced or whatever. So, I mean, there's a lot of factors in video because video is something that even podcasters need to consider. But you can be forgiven for having less quality video but your audio has to be good because people cannot stand bad audio yeah and podcasts of course are the sort of flavor of the month right now well they've been for a while i guess yeah so audio definitely important yeah and i mean just from stats that i've seen with podcasting they say that in the morning afternoon people will listen to the audio but at night they'll listen to video so you also have to consider like people's habits on when they listen to audio to when they listen to video. And that could actually help businesses as well too. Maybe they just release it, their video later at the night and they release their, and all that stuff because everything is about timing sometimes and you have to figure this out. Right. Which again is back to analytics because that's the kind of thing that you can see is, you know, what's the most popular day of the week. If that's, if that's relevant, you know, time of day that people are consuming, the most content or, and again, you know, one of the great things about analytics is that you can drill down and, and segment your audience into different categories because uh, looking at all of your visitors in one conglomerate mass doesn't work because people are doing things for different reasons. Um, so it's not just who watches your video, but looking at the outcomes of watching your video. So if your video is designed to create an action, like, I don't know, buy something, sign up for a list, whatever it is, you know, when do your most qualified visitors watch video? So not just when do all visitors watch video, but when do your most, your best visitors watch video? And you can get to that level of granularity and that can be really helpful. Yeah, I mean, it, it like I said, it's all, it's all about timing. You're right, like granularly you can do this, but for SEO specifically, is content more the forefront now, given with GA4? Is are, is Google caring more about the authenticity of content? Because I know before it's been like just backlinks and like they said, well, it has to be a good backlink, not a bad backlink, because everybody was just throwing backlinks at it just to get their uh, their website. So are we going to see that more with content too? Good to content versus bad content? Because everybody can make content and then you have to consider if it's actually going to be good, trustworthy, educational and all that stuff. Are we going to see more of that with Google changing their algorithms? So they always change that SEO all the time. Yeah, no, we already are. I mean, Google is much more focused now on the value of the content. So, you know, is it helpful to the audience? Do the audience spend time on it? Um, you know, you, what Google doesn't want to see is that they, they, they go, they click on a link in Google through to your site and then they bounce back um, because what that tells Google is that content isn't useful. So these days, um, quality, engagement, value is is much more important than the in some ways than than the backlinks and the keywords and which is still obviously very key. Um, but yes, quality is 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 really important. And so should like, let's say B2B want to get into more video focus because they haven't been video focused, should they use AI to help like maybe do the ideation part of it? Because AI is great for helping people. I mean, I should, you shouldn't just you trust AI completely and be like, do it all for me because I've seen videos of AI creating videos and they're, they're weird. They're really weird. So should, should they help start that process off? Cause I'm pretty sure a lot of marketers aren't, well-versed in video production. Oh yeah, no, it's great for ideation and, and for, um, you know, generate me 20 potential titles for this video so that, you know, I can see which one I like. That kind of stuff is 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 very fun to do and, and very helpful. Um, so yeah, no, I, I, I wasn't saying to discount AI at all. Obviously you can't and, and you, um, but you need, you need to think about what you want it to do for you so that the way that you prompt it is gets you the sorts of, of responses that are that are helpful to you. 
That's true. It's almost like Google search. If you do the wrong prompt, you're never going to get the right <laughs> answer. <laughs> right, right, right. And so, I mean, I, I've used some of it. I've used Bard. Bard's a little bit better on like creating scripts and Jet GPT is good for like specific like answers to your questions. So like if, for this should, should is there is there a difference between which ones they should be using and for AI like do you have any like ways of like creating the successful prompts because prompts are just kind of like the bread and butter for AI so do you have any like insight into creating good prompts for AI um i'm finding that you you kind of learn as you go along i mean you know you 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 it's it's the experience also tells you what kind of of what what you're going to get back and therefore what what's going to work for you and and again you know i should say that ai isn't my specific expertise so um i i i don't want to give you a list of, of i mean i've tried various things um but i i think businesses that want to use it should because there are so many tools you know you need to figure out which one's going to work for the specific needs that you have yeah, there's there's always one popping up. I mean, I can't even keep up with all the tools popping up that are featuring AI. And I'm like, okay, well, right. I'm now it's like, just... is this really going to help me or is this just another tool to play around with? Right, right, right. And, you know, in some ways when it says featuring AI, I mean, to some extent, you could you could argue it's been around for a while already. Um and that essentially using a computer is is using a form of AI. So um, maybe not very sophisticated, but, you, you know, I, I, I it's, yeah. <laughs> well, you could even say like going further back, like machine learning was, I guess, the precursor to AI because machine learning was learning things and it kind of gave you, for the most part, it was not bad. I mean, Google Assistant, which is machine learning, is pretty good at giving you answers. I mean, it's not 100% correct, but... It's like 80 on the percent. I think it's 80 percent correct. So, I mean, you could say that machine learning was kind of like the, the the precursor to what AI is trying to become is the best way of saying it. And so, I mean, what are some like traditional tactics that B2B should still consider using? Because, I mean, we could talk about the future stuff all the all we want, but we always know that like word of mouth is king. Like you can never like not not say enough about word of mouth because word of mouth just is the thing that you can never replace. So what traditional marketing tactics should they should still be considered, including SEO? You know, I, I, I think I've lost the screenshot now, but back in 2008, which is now what, 16 years ago? Um, I think it was 2008, 2009. Wired Magazine had a big headline article called Email is Dead. And, you know, the premise was nobody uses email anymore. It's boring. Millennials don't like it, et cetera, et cetera. And here we are in 2024 and every marketing survey that you look at that says, you know, how do marketers prefer or what's the best quality communication tool? Email is right up there. It hasn't gone anywhere. Um, so that's one that, that, you know, you can't ignore email and, and you know, keeping your list clean and, and so that it's up to date and doing all those kinds of things, really, really important. Um, one of the biggest mistakes that I continue to see, uh, apart from not creating your strategy in the first place, is lack of calls to action. So it's still amazing to me the number of, of websites where, you know, you've got a page of incredible information, maybe a blog or maybe a video, whatever it is. And there's nothing that says, okay, what do you wait? What, what do you want me to do now? How can I get this? How can you help me with this? Um, and, and it's amazing to me that people forget the call to action or they put the call to action, you know, like right at the bottom of the page, assuming that everybody's going to read all the way down to the end of the page, which not many people do, you know, which is back to the analytics can tell you where people tend to fall off scrolling down a page. And, and I say to people, you know, there's absolutely no reason why you shouldn't have your call to action several times on the page so that people see it and they see it at the point where based on your content, they're probably saying, if they're going to be interested, they're probably saying, okay, 
how do I get this? Tell me more. Those kinds of, of engagement emotions, that's where you want a call to action. And uh, it, it's just, it's amazing, as I said to me, how many people, uh, how many sites still don't do that effectively. So it's still like back to the traditional press release of making sure everything's important on the first paragraph, at least maybe a little bit further down, but at least somewhere in the top where people be like, Oh, can I click this to go over here? And then making sure you have the sales aspect of marketing because marketing is like really closely tied with sales. So you have to have a, well, you should like sign up for this. We'll give you like a free thing. If you sign up for our email newsletter or some type of call to action. So you're seeing right. a lot of businesses still forget the call to action part. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I'm, I, I'm saying you've got to have a strategy for your digital marketing. You've got to have a strategy for your website, but not only a strategy for your website in terms of what do you want the, the site as a whole to be doing, but essentially every page of your site should have its strategy. So for every page of content that you have, you want to be saying, well, what do I want people to do as a result of seeing this page? And I mean, it, it's unlikely that your answer to that would be, well, that's fine. They can just go away, right? You probably want them to do something. And if you want them to do something, you've got to tell them what that is and you've got to tell them how to do it and make it really, really easy. Because if you don't, um, and again, you know, with analytics, you can see the paths that people take. You can see how people move through the site. So you can see how many people drop off. You can see where do they go to next. And the majority of the time, it's not where you would want them to go. And many site owners, designers, etc., they're so, it's not your fault. You're so close to your own site that, I mean, a number of people who've said to me, but Philippa, it's obvious because they're so close to it. And I, I say, no, no, it's obvious to you but it's not obvious to somebody who's seeing this for the first time. So you have to drive people to the outcomes that you want. So it's almost like trying, and I did this for one company where they gave me a software and I was pretending to be like someone new. And I was like, okay, where are the pain points here? Where am I going? Okay, this is confusing. It's almost like you have to get in that mindset of, I've never done this before. Where am I going? And is this the is this where I need to go? Yeah. I mean, user testing, you know, one of the great ways to do user testing is to give somebody who has never seen your site before, as you said, um, a task to do. And just walk away. I mean, stand behind them if you want to watch, where you can obviously record it as well, but don't prompt them. I mean, stand stand back and and watch how they go about it. And that can be incredibly informative about what's obvious and what's not. I mean, another piece of it is the search engine on your site. So if you're talking B2B, um, many B2B sites could really benefit from a good search engine that actually searches their, the, the site itself, right? Um, and that, and again, going to the analytics, that can be gold a gold mine um, because you can you can track the searches that were done in the analytics, and you know Google Analytics will do this, but so will other other good analytics tools. Um, so you can see what people are actually looking for, and that can be a real educational goldmine because it it tells you, for example, how people think about your products and services. So what words do they use? to look for what they're expecting to find. And that may be different, like especially with industries that have a ton of jargon. If the people who are buying your, your stuff are not familiar with your jargon, your internal terms for things, then you might be using words on your website that they don't recognize. And I, again, I've seen this with uh, you know technology type, manufacturing type companies. Um, so you want to think about what, what words do my visitors use to find stuff that they're looking for and, and structure your content around those words. I mean, you can teach them your jargon once you've got them, but, but first of all, you've got to get them. Um, it also tells you what kinds of things your visitors are looking for that they clearly expect to find at your site, but you don't provide because that's, that's great product research, right? What do people expect you to be offering them 
that you're not offering. And, may, and, and, and I've certainly worked with clients where we've looked at those kinds of things and we've come up with new products or services based on, hey, yeah, they're right. We have that expertise. We just never thought of offering whatever it is they're looking for. And so the site search can be an amazing research tool. And a lot of times you see, you know, that little magnifying glass that's right at the top of the page in the nav bar. And as soon as somebody scrolls down the page, it's gone. And then they're not going to think that there's a search engine. So, you know, the same thing, kind of thing as the call to action. If there's something on the site that's really going to help them and help you, then, you know, don't bury it so that they can, that very few people will even know it's there. I mean, so yeah, for the, for the jargon, I mean, even in marketing and like SEO search engine optimization, like API, KPIs, like all this other, like, and that's, that's, that's the all well, basically digital marketing jargon. It's almost like your website needs like a dictionary page just for all your jargon. So people understand, or at least a hover thing where it's like, this is what this means for those. Cause in PR, uh, if we're saying something new, we have to describe it. And then afterwards we don't describe it anymore because we've already told you what it is. So should they be thinking in, the, in those terms for jargon specifically, because you are going to get customers that are, that know your jargon, but you're also going to get new customers that don't know your jargon at the same time. So let's say, for example, you're a B2B computer company building up computers and you use CPUs, GPUs, and all the other jargon. And everybody's like, wait, what is that? What, what, what does that mean? Like, like CPU is like the, it's the processor and the GPU is the graphics card. And people go, oh, okay, I know what that means now. So how, how do they help with, with all that jargony stuff? Because you can't get away from it because you're going to, you're gonna, if you know the industry well, you're going you're gonna to use the jargon because it helps you talk faster in some ways, but also helps you like bridge that gap between the experts as well. So how do you, how does a marketer bridge that gap between the expert and the new person that's just coming to your website for the first time and going, what the hell does that mean? Yeah. And I, um, I mean, first of all, a glossary certainly used to be a really good SEO tool because it basically just contains a load of keywords. I, I, I actually don't know if that's totally true at the moment, but, um, you know, that's interesting because I've worked with, with, uh, actually I've worked with computer components, you know, like software component company, for example, that was one of my clients and, and they would say things like, look, don't worry about it because our buyers, our techies, they they know the language, they know the jargon, we don't have to worry about this. And I said, are you sure about that? Because imagine that a buyer or, or you know, the techie guy says, okay, I want this. And they go to the CFO and they say, I want this. And the CFO might say, okay, but how do I know that this is a reputable company before I write the check? So they or that department might go to the website to do due diligence on the company, right? And they don't care about the technical stuff. They want to know this is a real company that we can depend on and trust and we can send our money to. And um, so at least the About Us page, I mean, every company, every B2B company should have an About Us page, like who are we, what do we do? who are our principal people, and that should be in English or in, you know, in other words, in your vernacular without jargon. Um, and and it's it's interesting, again, um, you can use analytics to ask, answer a basic question, like how many people who are new to my website go to our About Us page? Because it's a lot. You know, if they don't know you, they're going to look there to find out who you are. And, and in my humble opinion, that should be a page that is not full of jargon because that's where you just want to impress people that you're a real trustworthy entity. That makes, yeah, that makes a lot of sense because you, I always said you can't get away from jargon, but you at least can have some pages that are jargon free or jargon less or don't have as much jargon in it, or you explain the jargon within the actual about page too. But you also have to assume that there will be visitors to your website who are not industry experts, you know, who are there because, you know, and bankers, insurers, I mean, you know, other types of, of people that you interact with will come to your site to do that due diligence. Um, 
I actually uh, worked at a company once that got refused an insurance policy because of something they said on their website. <laughs> um, but, and so, you know, you have to be aware of that. There are people that are checking you out. They're not customers. They're not potential customers. But your website is important in playing a role in, in your relationship with them. And so what do you see the future of B2B marketing going? Do you see like more AI? Do you see more of the traditional parts going back to just like making sure that you you have a newsletter or that you email is just as important as all the other new technologies? Like where do you see the B2B marketing like transitioning from in 2024? Well, you know, I, so I'm not a futurist, but honestly, um, like I said, I've been doing this for a while. I think the way we do stuff like, okay, now we have AI or, or different tools, different different techniques for doing things. Um, but, you know, the basics, the fundamentals don't really change. So as a business, in order to sell stuff, you've got to prove, you've got to have social proof, you've got to have credibility, you've got to appear to be focused on quality, being trustworthy, right relationships etc and how that's done might evolve but but that fundamental doesn't go away and i also as i keep also coming back to the fundamental of having a clear marketing strategy with measurable goals shouldn't go away either how again however you do that um just because there are new bright shiny objects around to play with that shouldn't negate the importance of having strategy so where can people find you online to learn more about your expertise and just SEO in general? So, well, I'm, as I said, I'm more of an analytics strat and strategy person than the SEO. Um, so you're welcome to look me up on LinkedIn and I'd love to connect with anybody that's watching the program. And uh, my website is websites that win. So websites that win.com. And uh, I do have actually a, an ebook which I'm about to put on my website, but if you ping me, I'll be happy to send it to you anyway, um, which is some real life stories of how we've used analytics to come up with an insight that we wouldn't have known without that data that's allowed us to significantly grow the business. All right. Any final thoughts? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's been fun. And uh, thank you for... Uh, asking about tea and coffee at the beginning that was fun and let me well let me ask you um what do you think was the most important message that we put out today most important message was even if all the new technology is there well there's a few of them basics is still still king like traditional marketing will still never go away uh just because you put jargon on there doesn't mean that everybody's everybody understands your jargon you need to appeal to the new customers plus the old customers or the experienced customers at the same time great and keep thinking about your strategy and keep thinking about what you want people to do next yes always look at the customer journey on your website right all right. Well, thank you for joining Digital Coffee Marketing Brew and sharing your knowledge on analytics and digital marketing and B2B marketing. Great. Thank you so much. It's been great to be with you. And thank you as well. Please subscribe to this podcast on all your favorite podcasting apps and leave a review. You'll just help join us next week as we talk to another great thought leader in the PR and marketing industry. All right, guys, stay safe, understanding your analytics and your SEO and your customer journey. And see you next week. Later.